I was FaceTiming my best friend a few weeks ago, and our call got cut short. And when I called her back, I had my surgical scrubs on. And she said, wow, look at you. It's like Clark Kent turned into Superman. And she's right, I do feel like a superhero in my scrubs. I became a veterinarian because I wanted to fix dogs, but I became a surgeon because I wanted to fix them with a drill. <laughs> <laughs> I have spent more minutes training to become a surgeon, being a surgeon, and even thinking about being a surgeon than anything else. Being a surgeon defines me. And being a surgeon truly is a great superpower. And sometimes I get to use those powers. This is Claudia. She's a 365-pound moon bear. Now, moon bears should normally be roaming the forests of Asia, living in trees and forming family units. But Claudia was a captive. She was held in a tiny cage, barely able to move so that bile could be harvested from her gallbladder for traditional medicinal uses. But Claudia was rescued by a wonderful organization called Animals Asia and taken to a new home. Yes, they're great. <laughs> taken to a new home where she could forage and play and make friends with other bears like her. Claudia was hit by tragedy again when she was diagnosed with not one but two broken elbows and a condition called IOHC, or incomplete ossification of the humeral condyle. And that's how I came to know her. On my 40th birthday, I received an email from the Animals Asia team asking for my help. Now, the broken elbows are notoriously difficult to fix, and the humerus, which is the bone that was involved, um, makes surgeons run in the other direction, afraid of a successful outcome. But still, this was a, a dream opportunity for me, and I was in, in an instant, I said yes. So Claudia's veterinarians took her to a human hospital for a CT scan, and we even had a 3D printed model made of her elbow so that I could visualize the fracture, even hold the bones, and plan for surgery before the day of surgery itself. And her surgery was grueling. She broke two of my drills with her hard, bare bone. And there were moments in the operating room where we felt like we couldn't do it. But we persevered, and through a total of 10 hours of surgery, we fixed those elbows. And this is Claudia being released into her recovery den just three weeks after her surgery is walking. <laughs> so Claudia's story made headlines around the world, how a team of animal advocates came together to save a bear, a veterinary surgeon, wildlife veterinarians, nurses and staff and sponsors all came together to save this bear. I truly felt like a superhero. I could tell my family and friends this story and send them the headlines. And every veterinarian I know has a superhero story that they share with their family and friends. We all got into this, not only because we love animals, but because we want to fix them, we want to save them. And we're all a bunch of superheroes. So it may surprise you to learn that my profession is suffering. There is an epidemic of stress and anxiety and even suicide among the veterinary profession. And veterinarians are four times more likely than the general public to commit suicide. So why is this happening? Well, for one, we're a bunch of perfectionists. We're very hard on ourselves. We work really long hours, and they're often unpredictable. We have uh, many veterinarians that are struggling with debilitating student loan debt. And we are deeply and emotionally connected to our patients. From day to day, or even minute to minute, we can go from joy to devastation in our profession. We have a wagging puppy in one exam room and a cat who's dying of lymphoma in the next with a very distraught owner. Vulnerability for me comes in my interactions, not with my patients, but sometimes my wildly varying interactions with the humans who care for them. A few months after Claudia's surgery, I had a far more routine patient, a tiny little dog with a broken front leg, not far off from Claudia's. So we took her to surgery, and we fixed her. And my nurses and I looked at her ho lang, which is Cantonese for very beautiful x-rays, after surgery, proud of ourselves, and we sent her home. But this little dog had some diarrhea in the car on the way home. Her medications had made her nauseous. Her owner called to let us know, and in the 30 minutes that it took us to return the phone call to her owner, she had turned to social media. So this is uh, roughly translated from Chinese, but it says, God is watching, be afraid of karma, and be afraid to go to hell after you die. And this post was written about me. 
So within the next couple of days, dozens of other pet owners were chiming into the conversation, often with medically inaccurate information, disparaging comments about their own veterinarians. So what had just happened? A few months prior, I was losing sleep over Claudia and how to fix that elbow, and now I was losing sleep over what this post might do to my reputation and to my business. And what if my family and friends saw this? It's not comforting to know that I'm not alone. A very talented colleague of mine just got an email a few weeks ago that said, I hope that you cry in the shower over all of the pets' lives you've ruined. And, and I thought, well, sometimes we do. So in human medicine, a successful doctor-patient relationship has three very key characteristics. Trust, loyalty, and regard. Trust means that not only can a client trust in me and my competence and in my caring, but also that I can believe in them. Loyalty means I'm committed. I'm not going to abandon a patient or their family. And it also means that I can believe that a client will forgive me and knows that I'm human. And regard means that a client and I can look at each other and say, hey, I know you're on my side. But there's vulnerability on both sides of that equation. Pet owners, because their pets' lives are at stake, and me, because medicine is inherently unpredictable. Now, making headlines fixing an endangered bear is not the norm for me, and luckily, neither are social media threats. I have some of the greatest clients in the world. The pet owners in Hong Kong are fantastic. They ask smart questions, and they do their homework using reputable sources, and they treat my nursing staff, who are superheroes in their own right, with kindness and respect and compassion. But those few people who try to tear down the heroes, well, some of us aren't that well equipped to just ignore it. So I lost a lot of sleep over that upset pet owner, but I would far rather lose sleep thinking about how to save patients like Shia. When I first met Shia, she was an 11-year-old, banana-eating, tail-wagging black lab. And her owners had been told to put her to sleep. Her veterinarian had run some tests and had quickly and astutely assessed that she had bleeding around her lungs and that the most likely diagnosis was inoperable and terminal cancer. And when I met her, I completely agreed. I told her owners that she had about a 1% chance of surviving what was going on. Now, to me, that meant that the magical surgery fairy could come into the operating room and save her. 1% to me means pretty much zero, but to her owners, it meant greater than zero, to her parents. So they said, we want more. What else can we do? And we had a conversation. We talked about anesthesia and a CT scan and even surgery, and they asked all the right questions. What are the risks? How many of these have you seen? Are you the best person for this job? And importantly, what happens if we do nothing? So we decided to take her for a CT scan, and our worst fears were confirmed. She had a tumor just next to her heart that was causing the bleeding into her chest. And I looked at her parents, and I said, I don't think this can be removed. I don't know if she'll survive the surgery, and I certainly don't know if she'll survive the post-operative period. But they knew that not going to surgery meant giving up without a fight. And so we took Shia to surgery with the understanding that we would do everything in her best interests. In surgery, I lost about 10 years of my life in that surgery, um, her, her beating heart was continually beating, but I was able to sort of use it as a rhythm to dissect around this mass, which was, couldn't have been in a more dangerous location. But when that tumor fell off into my hand after the final dissection, I don't know if the applause in the OR was real or in my head, but I knew that we had done it. We had removed her tumor, and I was able to close her up and go and tell her parents that she had survived the surgery. I felt like a superhero then, that's for sure. So this is Shia celebrating her 14th birthday three years after that surgery. <laughs> Yay. She still eats bananas and she still wags her tail, and amazingly, that tumor was benign. So think about that doctor-patient relationship for a second. Trust and loyalty and regard. And those are things that we willingly give to the people we look up to, not just the superheroes in the movies, but to our mentors, to professional athletes, to the royal couple. <laughs> 
But what about to our doctors? And what about to our teachers? What about to the lady at the airline counter? What if we defaulted to trust and loyalty and regard in every relationship that we make? Think of the superheroes we could create. She, as owners, were given a 1% chance of, a, of success, of a successful outcome. But they showed trust in me, and I gave them loyalty in return, and we persevered together, and I drew strength from them. That, to me, is the real story in veterinary medicine. Being a surgeon is a great superpower, but it's not about the scrubs, and it's not about the instruments or the diagnostics. It's about the people that surround me. No superhero exists in a vacuum. We all rely on the people around us. So what made Shia's story great isn't what happened in the operating room. It was the trust and the loyalty and the regard that we shared in that consult room. And that, to me, is an even bigger story than Claudia the Moonbear. Thank you.